So this morning, though, I'm going to give you my take, some of my experience on how hope is given to you, how you might get it, rather than you figuring out hope so you'll have hope. What's the difference between Old Covenant hope, Jewish hope, and New Covenant Christian hope? Is there a difference in the hope that we have between what they had and what we have now? Is there a difference? And I would say, oh yes. And um, what I want to share with you this morning, I hope goes toward finding hope, knowing hope, getting hope in your day, however yours looks. Because that to me is the most important thing there is, is to assist you in your day with God. To know him, because that is Christianity. That once he's arrived by faith, when you've received him, the joy after that is to know him and to find him capable and perfect with you and in you and through you. And you end up offering your behavior to him, and it feels so normal, so much like you. That is our hope. So, how it happens to us, though, is unique to each. Of us, And if you don't know that, or if you aren't okay with that, you might end up feeling like you're the worst Christian. Or one day you're bad, the next maybe you have hope to not be bad. Or maybe you have a week of bad, or you're avoiding bad. But either way, you may think that you can mess it up. And you can get rid of hope, block hope, stop hope. And hope really is effectively... Um, a belief in the truth and, and an expectation from there. Those two things, belief and then an expectation that may lead you to do something or not do something, as the case may be. So I want to tell you of a time when I was um, clued in by God as to this great plan he had for me. Do, do, do you all like great plans from God? Are you, sh no, no, not always. <laughs> That's probably a good reluctance to commit to that. It was a trick question. Um, it sounds good, though. Where God guides, God provides. We have all kinds of good sayings that to me have meant in the past, if he's doing it, it's going to go well. You want to be in on that. And if you know that God's doing it, where else would you rather be? With him. So, some years ago, um, probably 1999, somewhere back there, um, I began to think, I lived in California, I was raised there, I apologize for that. So, um, but I'm, I'm married, I have two young girls, um, three and five, maybe two and four, and I begin to think, are we moving to Colorado? Oh, that can't be, because everybody wants to move to Colorado. Amen? There's a few. Okay. Um, so I thought, ah, can't be. No. But I'd see a truck go by with some Colorado thing on it. Or I'd see some advertisement about Colorado, and I'd kind of, <gasps> and I'd, oh, no, what does this even mean? Probably nothing. And I kind of shuff, shuffled it off. You ever do that? Nah, nah, can't mean anything. Nah, 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 nah. Anyway, it, it continued. And then one day, after about a month or two of this, um, my wife and I were riding in the car, doing nothing, minding our own business, and somehow it came out that she too, apart from me, hadn't said a word, was thinking and said something like, I wonder if we're ever going to live in Colorado. And I went, oh, oh boy, that's weird, this is strange. And I said something like, oh, probably not, you know, man of faith. And um, she said, well, yeah, but what if? And I said, man of faith, probably not. What if? Probably not. What if? Probably not. <laughs> so it was a beautiful moment in the car, and she looked at me like, what is wrong with you? And I said, well, there's a lot, but I'm not sure this moment is one of those. And um, so anyway, you know perhaps the, how that story went. It turned out that there was an orchestration of people and events and opportunities that got us from California to Colorado. So um, part of that was that, you, that I was to go there and start a new church out of several churches. I would 
collect or they would collect for me um, certain willing people who had various gifts and talents and probably issues and th things like that. And together we would start this church in Colorado. Doesn't that sound good? Anybody? Yes. Thank you for that. Mm. So we said, okay, good. We'll come out there and we'll get this going. And uh, well, I want, I'm not going to ask anybody to come with us, but my wife and I will have meetings. We'll teach. We'll speak. And we'll say, here's what we're thinking of doing. Here's who we are. This is what we're like. We got these three really cute little girls. Look at that. Everybody wants to go with them, right? So um, this went pretty well, um, and on, there was a day when we then announced, okay, anybody who wants to go with us, I was, I was on staff at a church there, out of which we were going to plant this church. Um, so there was a day when they would say, anybody that wants to go with Ralph and Sarah and Ellen and Emma, stand to your feet, come on forward. This was going to go great. Well, um, that's not how it went. The, the guy who had said, this is how we'll do it, said, look, I know there's two families that want to go. Why don't you and you come forward? And I'm like, and all these people in the audience are looking at me like, like they were pinned because the pastor there had said, only these two families are going. And I'm kind of, oh no. So he said, then Ralph and Sarah, why don't you come on forward too? So as I passed him, I said something like, there are others. You should just do it the way you said you would. And he said, oh, and if there's anybody else, um, you know, and you just really have to go with them, then come on up too. Well, what happened? A bunch of people got up, came forward, and Sarah and I were overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, this could actually work. Wow, amazing. We were overwhelmed. Well, my relationship with that pastor suffered terribly from that day forward. Awful. Because there were people who were well-funded that were leaving his church to go start this church with me, which I thought, that's kind of by design, isn't it? Aren't you supposed to let people go that feel motivated by God? I mean, it isn't the whole thing to have God know, uh, people know God and then follow the leading of the Spirit. Isn't that like Christian, I think? So anyway, from that day forward, he did everything he could to stop it and to stop me, to let the air out of my tires, so to speak. And I began to be, um, I'd hear of things that were said about me. Um, I was denigrated, uh, tortured. I would say, um, verbally. Anybody of you, any of you know what verbal torture is like? I was represented as being a sheep stealer, uh, um, a, a heretic, a hack. And, um, oh, it got really bad. And there was a denominational meeting whereby um, they, they brought me in and they grilled me on, on uh, theology and what my purposes were. And um, was I enjoying this? How was my Colorado dream? Aspens and trout streams and skiing. What was happening to that? Bang, bang, bang. It wasn't going well. And then in the midst of all of this, um, I get an ear infection, a really bad one. And to make even, even more fun, my other ear gets infected. And both ears start to drool. I don't know a better word to say. <laughs> they both are so infected that everywhere I went, people would go, hey, you know, you got like, there's, there's blood coming out of your ear, man. And I'm, uh, uh, is it a good thing? And they would, no, it's not. And then I got pneumonia at the same time. So was I enjoying my days? No. How did I make it seem though? I'm hanging on as best I can here. Want to do this? And over the course of that time of planting this church and starting things, um, my hope, my dream of what God had said join me in were just beaten mercilessly. And so was my wife's. And every time something was said about me, um, a misrepresentation, um, it hurt her terribly. She wanted me to beat that guy up or, those, you know, <laughs> do something. And I knew from the Spirit, don't. 
stay with me, be with me, just know me. Is there anything you'd rather do than know me? Now, what was I tempted to say? Uh, I could think of a few things, but it was, no, there actually isn't anything better than knowing you, so I'll keep knowing you. What's going on? No answer. This continued for a number of months, and I was hanging in there, hanging on. And it came time for um, kind of an annual, for me, um, and subsequent to that, um, uh, for years I've been going to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Anybody? Yeah, so that came time for us to do that, and there, there were friends of ours there who uh, had a small, beautifully equipped cabin in which we could stay for free, which in the ministry, that for free, that last, those last two words are very important. Um, so we went to this. This is Jackson Hole, my favorite place in the world. I love to fly fish. Anybody out there fly fish? Huh? Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, that's my favorite thing in the world. That is my number one hobby. Um, so I thought, gosh, this will be great. We'll go, to the, we'll go to Jackson Hole. I'll surely get refreshed there. Won't it be great? So we get there, and um, how solid am I right now? Not, you wouldn't, know. I was, I was leaking oil and every, I was in not good shape. We get there, and I'm expecting, you know, Da, 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 my favorite place since 1965. I, I've gone there almost every single year. Won't this be great? My hope was pinnacled of how it would go. It rained. And rained. And rained. And I'm a dry fly fisherman, primarily. That means you want sunshine and warmth, and the bugs embrace their inner, we must fly, and they fly, and then they get whacked, and they fall in the water, and the fish go, thank you so much, and then I throw a, a fly out there and deceive the little slimy beast and exercise them and then release them, the wiser. Um, that's my goal. That did not happen. The weather was bad. Bad, bad. Now, I went out and went fishing some anyway because ah. I was already gutting it out, doing my best to do what I do. And... But it was it good? Not particularly. Had a couple things, but not much. The last day uh, that we're leaving, um, I wake up in the morning, and I feel like God is bothering me. And by that, I mean, I kept thinking in my head, go fishing one more time. I want to talk with you. Well, it's the last day. We've got an eight-hour drive. I've got two little kids in the car, or soon to be in the car. We've got to pack up. We've got to go. How does that seem to you, by the way? Is that, does that make sense? Like, sure, let's go fishing one more time. That's convenient. So I tell Sarah, my wife, and she, I figured she'd say, that's ridiculous. That's nuts. Come on, we've got to get home. We've got school in a couple of days. And she said, yeah, we should do that. Okay. All right, let's go. Okay. So we do. We pack everything up, get into the car, and head off to my favorite stream um, ever, which don't even ask what the name of it is because, sorry, not telling you. Um, so we, <laughs> we, get, we get to the river, and all I know is I'm hyper aware of God with me because I believe, my wife believes, go and do this go fishing one more time. I'm going to talk with you there. And he, has, he and I have a history in that thing, that delight of mine that I love to do so much. So I get out on the river, and that is fun for me. I'm, you know, I got the waders on, full regalia. I look really good in my stuff. And on the river, the sun has come out. Uh, there's a little bit of warmth. And as I, as I wade into the water, pushing against me, here's what I hear in my mind as I'm working the fly line out. Cast it there. And as I'm looking somewhere, cast it there. So I'm, okay. I throw the fly there. What happens? Bang. A beautiful trout takes it like I'm never letting this thing go. I strike, have this great 
um, exercise class for the trout, and it was just tremendous. I'm enjoying this. That was great. Release the fish, off it goes. And as I begin to work the line back out again, what do I hear in my mind? As I look over this way, cast it there. Oh, okay. I'll, that's, this is, all right. I throw it there. Same thing. Bang. Beautiful cutthroat trout. God's gift to Ralph. And I hook it, play it, have this great time. This goes on for 45 minutes. At least 45 minutes. Every stream, every hole, every pool I came to, if you don't know much about fly fishing, the fish are going to, they're lazy and they want food to be brought to them. It's like me, pretty much. And um, that's what they do. They'll get in a place that's easy to, to live in and the food comes to them and they're just real happy about that. So that's where they congregate. And so I would go from pool to pool to pool and every single time I would walk into a new pool, I would look around, minding my own business, and into my head, cast it there. And I would throw it. Bang. I never missed a strike. I hooked them all, landed them all. I probably caught, I don't know, 20 fish. It was, it was amazing. And I'm having the greatest time, so I'm totally locked in to, yes, Father, yes, Master, Yes, Lord, whatever, because <laughs> this is like the thing I want in my life. This is how I want my life to go. God talks to me. I do it. There's fruitfulness. Yay, this is, I can live with this, God. This is the one I've always wanted. So it is tremendous. And then I get to, to this one final pool, and I think that's probably going to be it because after that one is a long walk to the next one, and I'm kind of pushing my luck here I probably, or with my wife maybe and my kids, and they're in the car. Uh, watching Daddy have this blast out on the river. So I probably ought to get going here. So I come to this last pool, and there's a way of fly fishing a stream that's the right way. And there's a way to do it the wrong way. And just to sum up, the right way is if the water is flowing toward me, and it's deeper over there, you want to stand in the shallow part and cast your fly, cast the line over there to where the fish are. They can't see them. You go into stealth mode. You get a better approach to the fish. It's all about deception, which I just like so much. And um, you have a better chance of catching fish. That's the right way to do it. So as I approach this, this particular pool, the side that was over there that was deeper than, than where I was, and so I wanted to go on this side, it was also very high up. There had been a lot of erosion. So it was probably, I don't know, five feet higher than where the water was, the bank, that is. It's an embankment like this, a small little cliff. And into my head comes, wrong side, fish it. And I said, wait, wrong side, fish it. Why do I have to do that? I don't need to do that. It's wide open. I, I fish, God, I fish from this side. I fish over here. I fish on the right side, over to there. And it was as if God had glasses, and he put them down on the end of his nose and looked over the tops of them. Really? So I was, okay, yes, sir. I'm going to wrong side fish it, knowing I don't have to. I don't have to do this. I don't know why I'm doing it, but I, okay, yeah, this is going great. So yes, sir. Yes, master. Yes. So I get up on the stream, and I start to work the fly line out. And what happens? You know what happens. I get the fly line out, I ca and, and my head is cast it there, where you're looking, cast it there. I do it, fish comes up and takes it, swing and a miss. First time. What? That's different. Okay. Okay. Cast it there. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. And I am at peace, of course. No, I'm not. I'm getting bothered because I don't have to do it this way. Why am I doing it this way? I'm doing it wrong. I've been doing it right, and now I'm doing it wrong. I, I don't like this. And I have another God, door number three. I mean, I'm just frustrated. But 
because I'm tuned in. I mean, my radio dial is right there, right past it there, swinging a miss over and over and over again in this pool. I'm ruining it. It's my last pool. It's going to be my last memory of this great vacation. And I get toward right to the top of it, which is to say the end of it, um, for my purposes. And I, where am I again? I'm up on the bank, so I'm kind of precarious. And as I'm standing there, what happens to the bank? It decides to fold. And it does. It collapses. And what do I do? Ah, you know, I'm like, I'm trying to ride it down and be cool, you know, somehow maybe I can, maybe I can ride this out. No, I can't. I go down on all fours. I fall into the water a little bit. My fly line, which was already out on the, on the water, gets wrapped around willows, which is death to your fly line and the fly on the end of this thing. And I'm, sit, I'm standing there half in the water, half on the bank, trying to make sure my waders aren't soaking up water, making me a, a water balloon. And I'm just, this is ridiculous. And more dirt falls in. I'm spitting it out now. And I'm mad. All the, this, this joy I had, this newfound relationship with the God I love, was, had just vanished. And I was mad. And as I'm sta- sitting there, really, on, on all fours, I get up, and I start to untangle the line out of all the willows, and it takes some doing. And I'm saying, I don't have to do it this way. Why am I doing it this way? And here's what I hear in my mind. Just because I tell you where to fish doesn't mean you'll catch any. But doing this together delights me. Delights me, y'all. Now fish the top. Well, I was wrecked. I even now, you know, I remember it so well. Just because I tell you where to fish doesn't mean you'll catch any. And it suddenly meant everything to me. Oh. I thought that if you told me where to fish, that's what you've been doing, like all my life pretty much, especially today, that you would provide. Where you guide, you're supposed to provide. That's what I thought. That's what I've learned. And you're telling me that's not where my hope is. My hope is with you and really only with you. I mean, there are lesser hopes. You know lesser hopes? You get a boyfriend, you get a girlfriend, you get a new car, you get a job. There's all those things that are lesser hopes, yes, but those aren't necessarily Christian. This one was. And I was wrecked in the river as I stood there. And I saw that all that had been happening, I thought, was a disaster. And that I was therefore hopeless. I had wrecked it. I had failed to figure out what the right thing to do would have been to avoid the disaster that was going on. The sickness, all these things. My poor wife, powerless against the power that were, that were arrayed at me. Just because I tell you where to fish doesn't mean you'll catch any. But I delight to do this together with you. So, I collected myself, (laughs) got the line back, tied a fly on because, you know, it had gotten lost in the willows, and I looked to the top of the pool, and there was no top. There's this little slack piece of water that, you know, there was nothing there, (laughs) or so I thought. And so, I obediently, believing God, cast to the top, and Moby Dick. (laughs) Moby Dick came out of the depths. Swing, I got him an epic fight. It seemed like 10 minutes, this thing tore all over the river, tried to get out every way he could, and I'm yelling out of joy how fun this is. 
It was the greatest fight of a fish I think I've ever had then and since because it was so together with God. There was, should have been nothing there, and there was. And my delight was, you know, reignited, of course. And that changed what I thought and what I think about hope. When the stuff of your days beats you mercilessly or slowly, and some of you are going to get beaten or disappointed or hijacked, ambushed by things that happen in your day, the car you thought was going to be perfect isn't, the relationship you thought God gave you goes all wrong, I mean all the way wrong, and divorce happens. The sickness you thought you'd gotten over comes back. A relationship you thought you was solid betrays you. These things are going to happen in this world. They're going to, no matter how we orchestrate, no matter how we give ourselves to people. I mean, I even, you know, I want you to like me, by the way. <laughs> I do. I could become your slave sometimes. I feel like, will you like me? I know how this goes, but I've been freed by it because I know my hope, although some of it, it doesn't really lie with you. It lies with the God that I know and that I have in me, and you have him too. It's him. And your hope is in Him. You can have lesser hopes, but when those fail, when you fail, He will bring you back to the hope that He is so you can move on and go on and survive. So, I want to look at a passage in 1 Peter. Did you wonder if I'd get to the Bible? <laughs> well, I am. 1 Peter, chapter 1, we'll begin reading in verse 2. By the way, Peter is writing to Christians who were beleaguered. They were tortured, tormented for their faith, just to sum up. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Why is that important, by the way? He's telling them in one little phrase, you get everything for nothing. Your faith in Christ sealed the deal. Now you have everything. He's in you. You're in him. It's all yours for free. Grace. And for the rest of your days, grace is all yours. So peace, because of that, is yours as well. You have peace with God. You didn't earn it. You can't lose it. It's a gift you'll always have. You may be dissuaded. I thought for sure I didn't have peace with God. Something has to be wrong to explain this. No. I had peace with God. He'd given it to me. I just wasn't enjoying it. So he says to them, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, in all this torment, in all this stuff, and in all this thing that God has given you, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You're getting it. Number one from our passage. 
We are in a living hope. We are. If you've received Jesus and he has received you, this is a relationship that goes like that. We are in Christ. Know it or not, think about it or not, you have been relocated out of your ancestor, Adam, and put in to the kingdom of the Son, the Son of God. You are there. It'll always be a living hope. It'll always be secure. It'll always be perfect because of where you are in Him. We've talked about this recently, haven't we? There's a the theme. Look at verse 3 in 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You have a living hope. It may not be visible out there, but it is living because of where it is in Him. And that's where you are. Maybe you've lost your bearings today, as I do. But He would restore to you your thinking. I'm alive and you're in me. I will never, ever forsake you. No matter how things seem around you, never. Because you're in me. I know it's not easy to think of yourself as having been given a, a new birth into a living hope because there's other lesser hopes all around you telling you, oh, no, you haven't. But, oh, yes, you have. Number two, we are in our inheritance. We are in our inheritance. Verse three, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. You are in your inheritance right now. Ephesians chapter one says that there's also an inheritance in you, but the two both are true. Let's find out about that inheritance. Firstly, it is imperishable. There will not be a sell-by date. There will be no way for you to lose this. Dirty it, sully it. You can't get your hands on it and ruin it, in other words, because you're in it. And he put you there. And what awaits you is imperishable. For always and forever. It's secure. You're in your inheritance. Secondly, it's unspoiled. Unspoiled. Do you ever feel like, think like, the inheritance you would have gotten, the crown, the, the, the reward you would have gotten, has gotten worse? Maybe you used to be a better Christian than you are now. It's not true. It is unspoiled. No rot gets into where Jesus is, amen, or how he is and where you are. Nothing spoils where you are. You're in Christ. You're in your inheritance. It'll be him after all. And secondly, it is fadeless. There was another time I was standing on a stream fishing, and God asked me a question in, in the middle of the, of the river. Son, if you were to pop up on the surface of heaven in the next moment, what do you think your greeting would be like? I know. And I realized I had begun to think that on the faces of the people welcoming me to heaven would be a hint of disappointment. It could have been better. If only. And God said, do you not think that I don't value what you're going through. What little torment, what little thing you say that, that goes on with you, I value it at all. And your reception will be triumphant, as will yours. Because your inheritance is imperishable, unspoiled, and fadeless. Unchanging. Perfect. Number three. All that we have is secured by God. That's important, huh? 
All that we have is secured by God. Verse 4, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. All that you have is secure. Nobody gets in, breaks in and takes it. You can't wreck it either. It's secured by God. He's got it and he keeps it. Number four, trials prove our authenticity. Trials are not for you to pass, oh my goodness, I did it. Trials prove your authenticity. In other words, I did it. I do believe in him. I don't see him. I don't get everything. I, I can't help what I believe. I can't help it. I know him. I can't help it. He's become my number one satisfaction. I can't help it. And that is what God wants to prove to you. You haven't lost your mind. You have not blown it. You've still got what was implanted in you. It's secure, and you are authentic. However little it is, however it goes, God knows absolutely you are authentic. Count on it. Let's read verse 7. These things, these trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Through, though you have not seen him, you love him. Oh my gosh, how good is that, he says. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Sometimes, right? Yeah. Well, that's proving you're authentic. This isn't a continual torrent of glorious joy. That's not what this is. But occasionally, you're filled and it wakes you up. Do you ever have those times? God, I actually love God. Do you have that? He's proving you. Verse 9, for you're receiving the end, of, the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It's happening to you because you were his idea. Exactly the way you are, filled with flaws and weaknesses that you, you think he should value more than he does. But he sees those things as fleshly and not Not a problem because you, the real born-again, remade, new creation you, that is what he adores, treasures. Tell me about it too. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace to us and for your allowing for us to be real with you to express to you the the torturous times we have, the times when we fail and don't get it or blow it or someone else does and we're betrayed, disappointed. Thank you that hope is who you are. You are our hope and you aren't just distant and begging us to follow. You live in us and we in you and we have this hope. It's you. We've been born anew into a living hope. Thank you that knowing you is the pleasure and delight that we have and are growing in. And you'll always remind us that you've done this. We are your workmanship, your idea for your pleasure and glory and our delight to be found in you. That is good. Those of you who know this song, would you sing this with me? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but wholly lean on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
All other ground is sinking sand. Amen.